Welcome to Exploring Possibilities. I'm your host, Cheryl Sitz. Since 2012, Mario Rosales of Tech Life Balance and I have been airing inspiring, insightful conversations with all kinds of change agents who are raising the vibration on our planet. It's the intention of our show to explore possibilities and shift perspectives in holistic, spiritual ways. You'll hear how various industry experts discover and share their deepest passions to make a bigger difference in the world. You can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. And do me a favor, please come back and rate the show so that new people can find us. We'll introduce our next guest in just a moment. Have you ever gone to a social media seminar and you have the online experts telling you, get a blog, get a website, get on social media, all this other stuff. By the time you're done with that seminar, that online expert is very good at frying your brain. (laughs) The funny part is, you come back home, you get in front of the computer, and you're lost. Hi, I am Mario with Tech Life Balance. I see this all the time. You spend so much money and still don't know what is going on with your online presence. And you know, you probably don't need all of that. Let me go ahead and translate geek to english for you and show you what you really need because you don't need it all. You probably only need a few components. You have a great message out there and I would like to hear it and I definitely want to help you put it out there. I am Mario Rosales with techlifebalance.net. I produce this podcast because I love distributing messages. Let me help you distribute your message. Hi, it's your host Cheryl Sitz. And when I'm not doing this podcast, I enjoy offering live or remote coaching sessions to help my clients explore their possibilities. Maybe you have a physical pain and you've never really gotten to the emotional root cause. Wouldn't it be nice to be free of that? We can do that together. We can also explore what it is you really want or what's really holding you back and get rid of that too. There's lots we can do together. Contact me, CherylSits.com. Now on with the show. Remember, we have lots of great specials for you if you'd like to have us share your message to our growing audience. We reach thousands of people each week and we'd love to be telling them about you. So contact us at journeyofpossibilities.com and find out what we can do to help you spread the message and make a bigger difference. Today's guest is Karen Curry Parker. You'll find her online at understandinghumandesign.com. She's a best-selling author, human design specialist, trainer, and speaker. Karen has been a high-performance life and business coach for over 20 years, reaching more than 6,000 clients. Her books include Understanding Human Design, The New Science of Astrology, Discover Who You Really Are, Inside the Body of God, and her latest, Abundance by Design, Discover Your Unique Code for Health, Wealth, and Happiness with Human Design. Karen's been featured on Fox News, Bloomberg Business Week, CBS, ABC, and more. And I was so excited to be introduced to her through a mutual friend, Bonnie Carpe, who sent some other guests that you've enjoyed in the past. And we're delighted that Karen's with us today. Welcome, Karen. Oh, thank you, Cheryl. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, we just love having you. I have dug around a little bit on your site. You're up to some interesting stuff. And I look forward to learning more about it with my listeners. I found something kind of intriguing on your site when I was looking at you personally and your story. It says that you grew up in Lebanon and actually walked through refugee camps to get to school. And that really begs the question about the life path that you've lived that took you from that place to now helping us all find and live our deepest design. (laughs) You did dig deep. Um, I did dig deep. (laughs) Yeah, I, I grew up in, uh, not, I, I won't say that I grew up in Beirut, Lebanon, because we ended up leaving in 1976 when things got pretty dicey there. Um, but I did spend a good part of my childhood in Beirut, and we had to walk through a Palestinian refugee camp to get to school. And, you know, without being political, because I'm really not a particularly political person, and I certainly don't want to tread on that landmine, but... <laughs> um, it, you know, I would walk through this camp, and there were these people in this camp who you know, had obviously really just fled and had very little belongings. You know, they had a tent um, and some cooking ware. And there was this one old man in the in the camp. And of course, he couldn't speak English and I couldn't speak uh, Arabic. And every morning I would walk to school and somehow we managed to communicate our names to each other. So he would say, good morning, Karen. And I would say, good morning. And then he would always be cooking a, a cup of coffee. And it was one of those weird seminal moments I think you have as a kid that sort of anchored in my mind that it was so wrong that this elderly gentleman with these beautiful blue eyes would be in this situation where he had, you know, in the, in the 
the final stages of his life be wearing pajamas, which was the only thing he had, and have a coffee pot, and that was kind of it. And it really cemented in me at that point, especially because there was such a huge contrast between my lifestyle and, and what these people had, that we really, as light beings, inform and make a difference in the world so that we weren't so out of balance and that we could all experience the def the true definition of abundance, which I think, frankly, has very little to do with money and everything to do with security, safety, well-being, access to knowledge, obviously access to resources such as food and water and shelter, but also all of these other sort of intangible qualities that make being human so beautiful. Wow, I love that answer. Then you came forward into this work with human design, and from what I'm kind of tiptoeing around into, it looks like it's based more in the astrology and the charts of a person as an individual and how that would express through them. Am I getting the right idea? You are. It is. Human design um, is the synthesis of Eastern and Western astrology, the Chinese I Ching, the Hindu chakra system, Kabbalah and quantum physics. And what it really does is it spits out an individualized map of how you process energy. And it shows you your unique place in the world, what you're here to do, your life purpose, your way of actually accessing that life purpose, how to really live it, how to really make it happen in your life in a way that feels good and keeps you energetic and sustainable. And, you know, to continue sort of with that theme of, of walking through that refugee camp, you know, what, what the chart shows is, is that, and this is really looking at it from an archetypical perspective, because to me, the chart is really just a catalog of all the archetypes of what it means to be human. What the chart shows us is that we are designed to love ourselves, to each and every one of us be empowered as part of our own government and part of our own direction in life. We are designed to make an individual contribution that is unique to us in the world. And that's not necessarily something big and complex. That's just being who you are. You are the contribution to the world. We are designed to experience the past, learn from the past, do our forgiveness work and let go of the past and tell the story of who we are in a brand new way each and every day so that we're not stuck and trapped in old patterns. We're designed to take our direction in life from spirit and with a deep connection to source. We're designed to be healthy and vital and to experience vibrancy in our own bodies. We're designed, and this part is really cool, we're actually designed to receive, not go out and work hard, but to receive all the support that we need to fulfill our life purpose and we're designed ultimately to not only create for our own individual good, but actually also for the greater good of humanity. And to me, when I look at those those defining energies, which ultimately in the chart give you direction in life, to me, that just says that abundance is not just money, not just cars. It's about who we are. And it's about learning how to express the fullness of who we are and doing it as I said before, in the context of all the juiciness that it is to be human, but also recognizing that it's in each and every one of us. And we all have, by virtue of being born on the planet, I think an inner story that is begging to be unfolded that allows each and every one of us to pursue the unfolding of that unique story. You know, that's really exciting thinking about it in terms of the fact that we are all designed to perform at this very high, satisfied, abundant level. And it's really in learning how to navigate our own unique design. I am, however, curious to ask you, since you did mention that this blends Eastern with Western, where does karma play into all of that? Do, do you agree <laughs> with karma? Do you believe we come with a karma that may limit that? Where does that fit in? Oh, you're asking the hard questions now. <laughs> okay. So if we want to talk about karma, we have to get weird. So okay. Because there are some weird esoteric elements to this chart that are very different than I think in any other system that I've ever read anyway. The weird part goes like this. In your chart, there are three powerful direction-giving elements that are unique to you. The first two elements are called the design crystal and the magnetic monopole. <laughs> and you don't have to take notes. I'll keep it simple. <laughs> what happens is at the moment of your conception... These two energies or these two crystals are called forth out of the earth. They migrate into your the, the, the cells that will grow into your body. And contained within the design crystal is actually the blueprint 
for your physical body, your physical form, and actually the story of the, of the archetype that you're carrying in this lifetime. If you're familiar with Rupert Sheldrake's work, I have, I kind of think when I, cause I like to think scientifically, I really think that this design crystal, which, you know, obviously we haven't located it and discovered it. It's a theory, but I think it, it's interesting to think about it in the context of this is probably the vehicle or the, the crystal that holds the morphogenetic field for the unfolding of your physical form and more, you know, scientists, embryologists have yet to figure out how does, how do two, you know, haploid cells an egg cell and a sperm cell come together into you know, a, a zygote, and then ultimately differentiate into heart cells, liver cells, brain cells. Scientists don't know how that happened. And there's a lot of theory in biology that there's a blueprint and how that happens. And I think that blueprint is contained in the design crystal. The magnetic monopole, which is the other thing that comes up from the earth, is actually a magnet that only attracts. It doesn't repel. So nobody can actually push and repel things. You can only not be attracting. Okay. So oh, that's interesting. Um, the magnetic monopole actually resides, once it's fin you're finished growing, it actually takes its place in your heart, which, again, if you go and you look at, say, heart math and some of the other sciences that are out there, there's a lot of evidence now that shows that there is a magnetic resonance field in the heart and that it is quite possibly the place where the law of attraction actually resides and we attract through our heart what is correct and in alignment with the story of who we're going to be in this lifetime. The third element is called the personality crystal. That actually doesn't enter your body until you're about six months in utero. And that personality crystal actually contains the soul path or what your soul is here to do. I have a weird conversation about karma because I think karma tends to be like, you know, I killed your dad now in this lifetime when you come back and you kill my dad. I don't think that's karma at all. I think that's just interesting stories. But, um, <laughs> but I would say that each little element, particularly the design crystal, which is the mor morphogenetic blueprint or the template of who you are that's like a little energy suit and when you die it goes back in the earth and it can be called up and worn by other people all you know again and again and again or if you really want to stretch yourself deeply and think okay there really isn't a time spit you know there isn't really linear time you might even wrap yourself around the idea that your body graph has been worn multiple times and maybe is being worn mul by multiple souls at the same time right now in current reality. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, that was our brain bending. <laughs> Karma, to me, you know, you do bring a certain element of the past with you. Your soul does. And so, of course, the body, the design crystal also carries the history of everybody else that's worn this suit, right? Right. So certainly there are karmic paths, but there's also a lot of evidence to show that and it, this actually shows up in the chart. Each chart has what I would call a conundrum in it. I've never seen a chart that doesn't have one in it. Meaning each chart sort of shows that there are energies within each and every one of us that conflict with each other. Places where we bump up against ourselves. Places where we are, to a certain degree, designed to struggle. I'm not saying suffering, by the way. We're not designed to suffer, but we are designed to struggle as part of our growth process. And we need to struggle in order to learn. Right. And I think that we carry with us in this very specific configuration that is you an opportunity to grow on a soul level and the hardwiring for the struggles that you need to experience for those lessons you're bringing forth in this lifetime are hardwired into the chart. So that's karma in my in my definition. What a great definition. I have never heard karma laid out that way. I like it. I'm kind of over here going, yeah, I agree with that. And I agree with that. That that uh, Those dots connect together really well for me. So, <laughs> so that kind of explains why we can be shooting ourselves in the foot, so to speak, just continually defeating ourselves, moving forward and then back and then forward and then back. That's the conundrum that you're speaking to. A absolutely. Or, or I've heard it said one time, one of my students said, yeah, it's new level, same devil. You know, your karma <laughs> is the same devil, right? <laughs> right. So are there as many, are there infinite numbers of human designs? I, I think I read that you said that there, there are five, but then I'm also hearing that the human design is unique to each of us. So how does that lay out for us? Well, there are, well, there, I'll be laid out for you mathematically. Well, I'm not going to do the, all the math because I'm not. You'll probably lose me if you do. <laughs> <laughs> but there are, there are five types. There are 12 profiles. There are nine centers. There are uh, 32 channels and 62 gates. And each of those gates can show up in one of six lines. So you can see that in the combination of just all of those elements mathematically, everybody's chart's going to be different right. unless you're born at the same time in the same place as someone. Twins tend to have similar charts, but underneath 
the lines of the chart of the gates, there are also bases and tones. I mean, if you know somebody's, uh, you know, time down to the second, nobody has the same chart. That being said, the overarching simplicity of the system, which is the part that I love the most, is you will live out the highest element of who you are if you live true to what we call in human design your human design type. There are five types in the system. Each type has a different role, a different job, so to speak, on the planet, and a different way of making decisions and a different way of staying sustainable and abundant. So when you understand your type, those five types are called a manifester, generators, manifesting generators, projectors, and reflectors. When you understand your type, then you immediately understand what you're here to do, or at least an aspect of what you're here to do. You understand the emotional themes in your life. You understand your learning style. You understand your work style. You understand your wealth style. And you get a decision-making strategy that's unique to each one of those types that allows you to figure out how do I make the decisions naturally, not with my head, naturally in such a way that I can consciously and with great awareness move myself through the unfolding of my life story and not get distracted and go down a rabbit hole or, you know, get into a convoluted mess and never really get to the next level to experience the, the same devil in a new way. So, <laughs> so this really can empower us to get unstuck when we get stuck just by better understanding our type and how to move through that. Absolutely. If you understand, if, if you, if I only said to you one thing, I said, okay, Cheryl, in your case, you're a manifesting generator. If I said, okay, sure, you're a manifesting generator, and here's what you need to do to make a good choice. If you just did that, and you didn't worry about all the other complexities and the juiciness in your chart, and you've got a lot because I've got your chart open in front of me, you know, <laughs> that if you, if you only gave me that piece of information, you would have everything you needed to bring out the unfolding of your story and bring out the unfolding of your destiny, so to speak. So we can learn more about this on your website. I think we can get our type and our chart done. And then you've written a book that really helps us through some of these steps. You want to tell us about your new book? I have a brand new book. It's called Abundance by Design. And it's actually, it was a really kind of fun adventure to do this book. I train a lot of people to do human design as specialists and as readers. And you know, a lot of the people in my tribe have been living their human design for a long, long time. And one of the things that I teach people is that when you live true to who you are, your natural state of abundance, which we talked about in the beginning, begins to unfold. And so I went back to my specialists and I said, who's been doing this long enough to really feel solid in, this, in telling the story of the unfolding of your life into that natural state of abundance? So a lot and lots of hands shot up, <laughs> but I picked, I picked some of the top stories from my specialists who share in this book their story of how through living true to who they are, they really move beautifully into the full expression of their natural abundance. And then I thought, okay, this is beautiful. And, you know, I've been doing this work for a very long time, Cheryl, and I'm, I, I'm almost embarrassed to tell you that I was doing this work way before The Secret came out in I think, what, 2005. <laughs> Remember that movie? Yes, I, mean, I do. I always tell people, I was getting Abraham Hicks tapes, tapes, cassette tapes, you know, back when there was a monthly subscription and it came in a little pad and envelope <laughs> and I had a cassette player. So, um, which either means I'm really, really a late bloomer, which I think is probably pretty true, or I've been studying this for a long time, you know, and I, I've taught abundance stuff for a lot of years. Mostly I taught, you know, my dad says those who can't do teach, you know, so I think, <laughs> you know, I had some mighty, mighty struggles with money in my life. And certainly I taught a lot of abundance courses, I think, just to keep myself in that space of, okay, I can do this. Right. Um, but, you know, I watched a lot of, I've watched so many people do all the things that were trained to create success correctly. They follow the formula, right? They are, they're setting their intentions. They're doing their vision boards. They're, you know, visualizing. They're, you know, working on their mindset so that they're staying in a positive frame of mind and tackling their emotions and it's still not working. And one of the things that I really learned and I love so much about human design, which I've been doing now for about 17 years, is it started to explain how, each and every one of us really has a unique way of interfacing with the law of attraction. It doesn't mean that the law of attraction doesn't work. And in fact, you know, really when we, when you go deep into the chart, you can see the mechanics of it work very beautifully. Um, but the way in which you tap into that is different depending on how you're hardwired. And in addition to that, and this is the important piece, and this is what I talk about a lot in the book. We talk a lot about the phrase, I create my own reality. I'm sure you've heard that phrase, right? Yes. What we never tackle is who's the I that's creating the reality? 
And so much of what happens to us is over the course of our lifetime, and even sometimes, even even if you look at epigenetic programming, you know, in, in a lot of our cases, we're bringing into this lifetime on a cellular level programming. You know, we are conditioned oftentimes in such a way that we lose touch with the who the I that's creating really is. So in the book, I really walk you through how do you clear some of the energies that maybe you've taken in that have made you confused about who you think you are. I have also talk about where you are processing energy. Some of us have a lot of energy that we emit out into the world. You have a ton of energy that you emit <laughs> out into the world, okay? You're here to impact people in, in that, that very, very powerful way. There are people who have a lot of what we call openness in the chart, who are deeply sensitive. And you're you're intuitive and you're also sensitive in your own way. But and and there are people who are so open, so sensitive that in the swell of energy that they're experiencing from the people around them, it's easy for them to merge and get confused about whose energy are they running? Yes. Whose energy are they processing? And if you don't understand that about yourself, if you're not clear about where am I taking in energy and where is my identity coming from, and you're trying to create your own reality from somebody else's energy, it's not going to work for you because it's not true to what's correct for you. So you have to know how to untangle all of that conditioning and really get clear about who am I. And once you can do that, then you can go back to, I create my own reality, but you're creating from a place where you're much more aligned with your authentic self rather than somebody else's programming or somebody else's energy or old conditioning that comes from, you know, things that happened to your grandmother before you were even born. Right. And we've we've just been talking about that. We had Mark Wolin on who we had him as the, the cover of our magazine and on the show recently talking all about how that inherited family trauma and the stuff we bring in at a cellular level. And it's in our language and it's in our bodies. And, you know, and as I'm listening to you sharing all of that, I'm going, OK, and then we create relationships without even understanding <laughs> how we work. We merge with somebody else and take on all of that stuff. So how do you see that then coming into play for us? Well, I think the thing about relationships is when you can understand how you're hardwired and also understand how your partner is hardwired or your children or your parents, you know, gosh, relationships, that's not so interesting. I hope you go talk about that for days too. Um, okay, so I have to give you one quick fact because I think it's really cool and then I'll, I'll go back and complete the, the, the answer. You inherit your human design from your grandparents. So if you're able to look at your chart, you would see that your chart is going to be very similar to the charts of your grandparents. Now, if you can extrapolate that out, you know that your parents share similar patterns in their energy field and their human design chart to your children if you have children. So you can start to see how there's already sort of a prescription for intergenerational family patterns of energy, right? right? And it makes a lot of sense about why we have these dynamics. You tend to, when you grow up and go out and start dating people, you tend to date people who have the same energy configuration as your parents. So, you know, in more weird psychologies, we say, oh, you date your, if you're a woman, you date your father. If you're a man, you date your mother. It's more like you date your parents because you're drawn to energies that feel familiar. Even if you were in a rebellious phase with your parents, you still draw, are attracted to people who feel familiar. So you gotta understand that, first of all, because that's just a weird aside, but a, I think a cool aside. But in terms of relationships and in terms of creating or co-creating in your relationships, you do have to understand how the energy flow works. And you also have to understand where the sensitivities in your chart can sometimes create what I call mistaken motivations or create unmet energy needs that give you hidden motivations in relationships. Like, for example, you might feel like you have something to prove and, and that energy shows up in your chart. There are a lot of people who are designed to question their value and to go out into the world and be driven by a motivation to prove themselves. You don't have that, by the way, show. Um, Good so, to know. <laughs> um, but And so that's your underlying motivation. And then you go into a relationship and let's say you go into that relationship and there's money issues in the relationship and you have an unconscious script that you're running on, you know, hard work makes money. Okay. We all probably most of us have that somewhere in our script, right? Right. And so now you're going to prove to your partner because you have to prove your value. I can work really, really hard and I can make us a ton of money. And maybe you do that. But what if you're the kind of energy type? who doesn't have that sustainable workforce energy. And there are a lot of people who are not designed to work in the traditional way that we define as work. 
And so you go out trying to prove yourself, trying to run an old belief system that doesn't work for you. You're maybe even feeling pressure from your partner, depending on how the relationship configuration works. And now you're working super, super hard with energy you don't have, trying to prove a point that isn't really an important point to prove anyway, because you are really no matter what. And you are totally burned out at 40, 45, 50, because you can't do it anymore. And now your partner's going, what's the matter with you? Why can't you bring home the money the way you used to? And then you have big fights about money, and then things get really stressful. Okay, so taking that same scenario and and then overlaying my human design, understanding my human design, how's that going to help me? It's going to help you tremendously because you'll start to look at what's my work style? What's my wealth style? When I go into a relationship, what kinds of energies am I receiving from my partners? And you'll learn how to operate. This is my, my fancy terminology. You'll learn how to become a screen instead of a sponge. So you'll learn to go, oh, I'm experiencing this energy. Cool. Where's it coming from? Oh, my partner. I don't have to own it. I don't have to take it in and amplify it. I don't have to feel responsible for it. I can just go, oh, my partner's having this energy right now. So you'll learn how to navigate that flow of energy that you're receiving so that it doesn't hijack your system and cause you to become something you're not. I can see how that would be tremendously helpful. Just Mm -hmm. even learning how to become more of the observer of what we're going through instead of believing that we are what we're going through. Just that philosophy applied in any format helps so much. (laughs) Especially right now. (laughs) Yes, exactly. So I know that some of this is based on like our charts and where everything was aligned when we were born and all of that, as well as our genetics. How does that then play out against what's happening with the planets in any given moment? Is this something that we revisit regularly and align to the energies of this moment? Absolutely. You know, there is an astrological component. So the planets move (laughs) and they do their own thing. Um, And they bring us, they bring us energies. Those energies are actually designed to facilitate our evolution. So they bring themes with us. So for example, On this particular day, we carry in the planetary energy the theme of revolution. And of course, we have an, uh, you know, there's a lot of celestial energies with uh, February 2017. So there's a lot of energies about eclipses happening this month. Anytime an eclipse happens, it makes things extra intense. In the planet Uranus, we have it, the Uranus is traveling through what we call the gate 42 right now, which is the gate of endings. And Uranus is the planet of the unexpected. So Right now, the planetary theme is revolutions that can create unexpected endings, right? So this is an energy that we're all experimenting and exploring with right now on the planet. Everybody's receiving this extra added boost from the planets. So um, just like the rest of your chart, obviously, it gives you the opportunity to either evolve and grow or to not um and so you can then choose at that point with consciousness i did and actually every week i put out a little broadcast about what's up on the planet this week just because when you can start to understand it and start to see like oh this is an energy that i don't have in my chart so i'm going to feel it more intensely and it's going to bring me a theme i really need to pay attention to it's not something that is me as you just so beautifully said but it's something that's affecting me or flowing through me I can see it, I can process it, I can get the lessons and the blessings from it, and then when it shifts out, I can go on to my own next phase of personal evolution. The planet is evolving. In human design, the body graph, the the chart itself is actually in the middle of a flux in in a big evolution. We're actually slated for an upgrade in 2027. The chart is actually changing. So when we talk about being in the shift, so to speak, we really literally are shifting our whole physiology and our whole energy system is changing and the planetary movements right now are facilitating that evolution just so that you know and i think this is really profound and quite beautiful and hopefully gives people hope while things are shifting we are moving towards an era of sustainable resources and sustainable peace so even if it seems like right now oh my god things are really dodgy (laughs) we're actually moving towards something really great (laughs) but we're feeling it yeah Yeah. And especially, you know, for people that actually, I I can't imagine being one of them, but actually live with a routine in their lives of turning on the news and being fed whatever the news is spitting out at the moment. I don't get my news that way, because I think it's a little dangerous and out of balance. But there is a lot going on on our planet right now. And can you speak to how that's actually unfolding toward that shift that you're speaking about? Absolutely. I mean, what we're really seeing is we're moving from material beings to what I would call a quantum beings. You know, 
our understanding of science is really a, a reflection of our evolution in consciousness. Newtonian physics, which is very material physics, it's all that stuff we learned in high school, at least you and I did in high school, because we're about the same age, you know, about, you know, if you drop an apple and you drop a rock, they fall at the same <laughs> speed, you know, all that right. stuff about movement of physicality is, is there. As in the 1920s, the mid-1920s, we have the beginning of quantum physics, which, by the way, coincides with theosophy, new thought, all of this this beginning, quote unquote, new age stuff that we're doing. It's not really new age, but this whole, you know, positive thinking movement started in the 1920s at the same time that we discovered quantum physics. Quantum phys physics has shown us that the movement of molecules and the arrangement of molecules and the, the understanding that we have of matter are much more abstract. They're, they're literally atomic in origin and that we can move and change and shift matter with our consciousness. So we have moved from an understanding of a very material world that requires dense, what we call local movement. You have to, if you want to move something, you got to pick it up and put it somewhere to a quantum understanding that says with the right consciousness, the events can transpire where something can get moved without your sheer physical effort. The new human is a quantum being. And the way the chart is shifting is we're actually moving to where the energy for abundance becomes the driving force of the chart. Now, the energy for abundance in the human design chart is not related to work at all. It's related to vibrational frequencies and most particularly emotional vibrational frequencies. So we're moving to a place where we become aligned with source by holding the right vibration and creating things that feel right. The other shifts and changes that we see is that in the chart as it evolves is that the definition for intimacy and community and relationships is changing. And certainly we've already seen that just even since the 50s and the 60s. You know, we've had the advent of divorce, whether you want to call it positive or not, but certainly the definitions around marriage have changed. You know, we recently had the whole gay marriage piece. You know, we have now we're beginning to see a whole shift in our cultural understanding of even gender. So you see some of these shifts. What we see is the way in which we eat is changing. We are moving from right now, the way we're designed, we kind of need meat. It keeps us grounded. That energy that keeps us eating meat actually shifts and breaks away so that we become much more of a plant-based being so we can live off of vegetarian or vegan diets. We are moving into an era where our awareness of spirit as source and our emotional vibration actually creates peace, sustainability, and new communities. We're moving towards an era when the economic cycles are going to be rooted in a new set of values, and those new sets of values are rooted in love, nurturing, compassion, and fairness. The definition of abundance is in the chart is changing so that it's not a material level of abundance, but rather an immaterial definition of abundance, one that is less tangible and more rooted in the feeling nature of being human. Just to say, just to name a few things, it's a cool, cool thing. It's a really great thing. It, it's you know, I think if you look at the millennial generation, as much as we sometimes throw our hands up in despair, and I mean, I can say that I have, I have eight kids. <laughs> so um, one is seven and the rest are millennials. Um, so um, when I look at these kids and I, you know, and people will say, oh, the millennials are so blah, 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 right? Um, these kids have an inner sense of following what feels right for them. You know, and I think before they became millennials, they were indigos, right? right. <laughs> That's how long I've been doing this. That these kids have this inner sense, this this attunement to their feeling nature that is, I think, heralding the beginning of this very unique way of moving through the world with your heart and moving through the world in a way that isn't rooted in instinct and fear the way we are right now. I think you've just answered the question that had been formulating as I was listening to you because you really outlined how everything is changing. I mean, everything. They're just, you know, Mario and I joke all the time, what is normal anymore? Like normal's gone. <laughs> Anything we used to call normal is just gone. There, We're in this everything is shifting reality now. And the question becomes, how do we navigate that new reality when we don't even know what's coming next? And it is, it's following the heart, isn't it? Totally. And that's, the, you know, I actually literally just did a post about that um, this morning, is that you have to you have to find your place to connect with your own inner truth and to a certain degree, wait, don't react, but wait until you have emotional and energetic clarity and then take those powerful actions necessary. But you cannot, you cannot get distracted by all the noise if you're going to, if we're going to get through this in a, I mean, we're going to get through it either way. It's inevitable, <laughs> but you know, we can get through it 
in a beautiful, enlightened, aligned way, or we can get through it, you know, in a really cataclysmic, emotional way. Yes, <laughs> so, yes. Um, it's sort of up to us how we want to do it. Well, and I am feeling guided to share now on the show, because I say this one-on-one with people a lot, but I want to just say it in the show. I think that because, like you say, we can so easily get distracted. There's many distractions going on around us. We're having to learn how to stay focused and true to our own intuition, to our own heart. The way we do that is through distraction. Like, I think we, we're all thinking we'll get to, to this really zenful place when we finally get, get we've, when we've arrived. And it just doesn't play out that way. It's like the more we elevate, the more kind of the craziness appears around us to see, are you ready to hold your energy? Are you ready to maintain your frequency? Can you rise above it? Or are you going to be sucked into it? It's really an interesting dynamic that's playing out. It's so interesting. And I I love to how there's sort of a cyclical nature. I almost get, I keep telling my my clients, you know, we've been wearing training wheels or or we've had training (laughs) wheels on for a long, long time. And They've come in in 10 cycles. I've been called lately. I went back and I picked up Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Um, you know, because I thought, I kept having this thing, thought about, you know, here all these people went through the concentration camp, right? And he comes out of the concentration camp with all this message of hope and compassion and love for humanity. And I'm thinking, my God, how did he do this? I go open up CNN for five seconds and I'm like, man, I quit, you know? <laughs> and I think, I'm, I'm sitting in a beautiful house. I've got water. I've yes. got shelter. What's my problem, right? Yes. And And I think, you know, we've been preparing for this for a long time. It doesn't feel, I mean, I think, you know, we have to put our lives in context of the whole, but we have been preparing for this for a long time and we're ready. We may go kicking and screaming in the beginning, but at a certain point, we're going to get it. We're moving towards something quite beautiful, but we have to just keep taking deep breaths. Don't get distracted, (laughs) as you say, and, you know, spend as much time as you can on your meditation pillow and keep moving forward. Yes. And I think a sense of humor keeps me sane too. I mean, at some point we just have to laugh and go, okay, big picture, get back to the big picture. This is just a moment in time where it is about the big picture, right? The Messiah is very funny looking. Um, (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yeah, I get it. <laughs> well, and it is, it's actually a privilege to be alive right now. I mean, for as much as some of these moments get dark and funky, what an honor to be able to be the ones that are here experiencing this change. I, I just, I get really lit up about it when I think about the fact that I could actually be missing this. And wouldn't that be awful? I mean, we get to be here. <laughs> I think there's a waiting line up there. So. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I agree. They're out there with their popcorn going, it's my turn next. I'm coming in next. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, what else would you like for us to know about human design? I I don't go very scripted in my questions and things. I really like to keep this free flowing. But what what are some of the biggest little ahas that you can give us about what's possible for us if we step into understanding our human design? You know, the biggest takeaway or the biggest thing I like to share with people is very, very simple. And it's not complex. People always want me to talk about, you know, what is this color and this number and blah, blah, I mean, and, you know, I certainly, you know, I can t- talk about human design for years if you let me, but, um, you know, I think the piece that's just so important to remember, and I, I alluded to this in the beginning, but I think going back to this, there's nothing you have to do to make your contribution to the world. It's who you be. I always use this puzzle, this puzzle analogy. My students are probably rolling their eyes at me about at this point in time. But, you know, I have eight kids, as I told you. I also have a bunch of dogs and cats and a chameleon. And, you know, puzzles have an incredibly short lifetime in our house. If you lay out a puzzle, it's about 10 minutes before the dogs run off with one piece and (laughs) eaten it or somebody's ripped off a corner and tried to jam it in the wrong place because they got frustrated. And when you look at a puzzle that has pieces missing or you have it has pieces in the wrong place. And it's not very pretty. It's annoying, right? And it, yeah. especially if you're one of those people that likes to put shellac over them. <laughs> um, you know, we're only as beautiful as the sum total of all of our pieces. And you are here, and human design shows you this. You're here to fulfill a specific place in this puzzle, to be a specific part of the puzzle. And there's no getting it wrong. You're not broken. You're not stuck. There's nothing wrong with you. It may just be that in the time that you've been here, you've been trying to fill your piece in the way that you've been trained. And maybe the way that you've been trained isn't the way your piece works. Maybe you're a piece of the sky and somebody's been telling you, no, you're, you should be the ocean, you're blue. And you're like, no, 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 I'm the sky. 
be your peace, be who you are. And I, you know, to me, the profound part of the chart is it gives you an instruction manual for you to figure out how do I fill my peace in the best way possible? Because when you want to make a contribution to the world and you want to make the world a better place, and I have not met a person yet on this planet who doesn't, the most important thing you can do, at least first and foremost, is be the fullest expression of your piece of the puzzle. Because when you do that, you add to the beauty of the whole. And if you haven't figured out yet why it's not working for you, it might be because the formula you're trying to follow is wrong. So get your human design chart or whatever. You know, it's not I, I don't I kind of don't care how people find who they really are. There are lots of great modalities out there, but figure out who you are so that you can take your piece in the puzzle and keep adding to this beauty of who we are together, because right now that's what we need the most. Wow. I usually ask people for a parting thought, but I think that's it. I mean, that's you just tied it up and put a bow on it. It's beautiful. And I have to tell you, Karen, I've talked to a lot of people on this show and on other shows. I've been in media for a while. You show up with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your soul, and and you just put your whole self into this conversation. It's been such a joy today. I just love to, I could talk to you all day. <laughs> Yeah, me too. My dog would object, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> you are science meets spirit. I love how you bridge it all together and play with all of it in East meets West. Thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. It's really beautiful. Thank you, Cheryl. And thank you for giving me an opportunity to share. Would you like to be a guest on Exploring Possibilities? Drop me a note at info at journeyofpossibilities.com. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time on Exploring Possibilities.